Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I was waiting for the ability to say good afternoon, looking at the clock. Next week, we'll have a speaker from Santa Clara University who will tell us about under underrepresentation. All of you walk around with smartphones. Believe it or not, there are some people who do not have smartphones. So we'll find out who those are. Today I have the pleasure to introduce you to Cooper Quintin from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And he's going to tell us why we are all doomed. So let's, let's welcome him. Hi, thank you everybody. Uh, as Professor Ledin said, my name is Cooper Quinton and I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm a uh, technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which means that uh, I work on uh, privacy and security issues. I do a lot of programming. I also talk to a lot of reporters, pundits, uh, lawyers, things of that nature. So um, how many of you are familiar with the Electronic Frontier Foundation and what we do? Uh, that's great. So um, for those of you that aren't, Electronic Frontier Foundation is a nonprofit. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, but we work internationally. Uh, we've been around for about 25 years now, um, and we do a lot of interesting things. Um, one of the coolest things I think we do is currently we're suing the NSA over uh, warrantless wiretaps and spying on the American people. Uh, we recently flew a giant blimp over the NSA uh, data center in Utah with a sign on it that says NSA illegal spying below. Um, we were pretty happy with that. Uh, we also work on some uh, tech projects like uh, Privacy Badger is one that I work on. It's a browser extension that blocks third-party trackers uh, like advertisements and analytics companies from tracking you online. Uh, and we do it with an algorithm instead of a blacklist like some other uh, tracker blockers do. We also make HTTPS Everywhere, which is a browser plugin that uh, tries to connect you to sites over HTTPS instead of uh, unencrypted HTTP whenever possible. Uh, we have lawyers and activists and technologists, and we try to take sort of a multi-tiered approach to, um, oh, and our, our mission is to defend freedom of speech and civil liberties online. So we try to sort of take a multidisciplinary approach to that. Um, and so I am not a lawyer. I am a um, technologist. I'm a programmer. So none of this constitutes legal advice. Uh, in case I say anything here that you may misconstrue as legal advice, please don't. It was not legal advice. Um, so I'm here to talk to you guys today about security tools, uh, and specifically uh, what I think is a very overlooked part of security tools, which is the user interface. So obviously security tools are important, right? Uh, and security is important even if you're not writing a security tool, right? We have usernames and passwords, we have authentication, we have verification, we have cryptography, all for a reason, right? We don't want somebody pretending to be somebody that they're not, right? We want to be sure of who we're talking to, we want to be able to share secrets with another person, right? And these are all really important things, right? And good security tools are even more important because one of the common idioms is that people will use security only as long as it doesn't get in their fucking way, right? If you, if, and this is where you end up with users writing down passwords and putting them on sticky notes under their desk, right? Or using the same password for years and years and years, right? Or finding, users are, are very clever and they will find hacks around anything that inconveniences them, right? So it's important to make these security tools good, otherwise they just won't get used. Um, and encryption still works, even in these times of NSA spying, right? We know that one of the few things that works is a good encryption and a well-implemented security tool, right? And well-implemented cryptography can actually keep your secrets, right? Um, and so how do we write a good security tool, right? What are the criteria there? Well, a part of that is good security thinking. Uh, for example, getting your software audited by professional security people or professional cryptographers, right? Uh, using good cryptography, not inventing your own mathematical standards, right? Because I'm going to assume that maybe you are in training to be a cryptographer right now, but you are not currently one, nor am I, nor are most people, right? 
Um, so using, using cryptography that's tried and true is a good thing, right? And coming up with good threat models, right? Who, who am I writing this software to actually defend against? Most times, your threat model is not actually the global passive adversary, like the NSA, right? Your threat model is uh, some script kitty that wants access to the website, or uh, the user harming themselves, right? These are common threat models, and it's important to think about all these things. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about these things, and we're generally pretty good at this uh, as computer scientists. But good UI is really important as well, um, and it's often overlooked. Uh, you spend so much time thinking about uh, which data structures to use and which languages to use and how can I code this in the best way, right? And, and I get it, I live in the command line, right? We think in terms of lines of code, right? But you can't overlook the people that are actually <coughs> using the software that you're creating, right? And a bad UI can cause users to compromise their secrets, it can cause PGP, when people are trying to use PGP, oftentimes they will send out unencrypted emails not even realizing that they're doing so, right? Uh, and you can cause people to compromise their safety, right? Some people rely on cryptography software in life and death situations, right? And it's important to remember that, right? Um, and it can also cause people to not adopt your tool. If the thing you're writing is too hard for anyone to use, well, maybe nobody will use it. And then you've just wasted a whole lot of effort on this thing that implements all, the, all this really cool security and this really cool math that only you can figure out how to use. And maybe another trained computer scientist can figure out how to use it, right? So talking about cryptography again, Bruce Schneier, who's an excellent cryptographer, and if you guys are interested in security or cryptography at all, you should definitely check out his books. He has some great thoughts. Um, so one of his standard quotes is that anybody can create a crypto product that they themselves cannot break, right? And the idea is that you can, you can always create something that you can't figure out how to get around, right? But there's always somebody smarter out there and they're gonna be able to figure out how to get around it, right? So don't, don't trust your own self <coughs> as to how good this cryptography is. And I would present this corollary which is that anybody can design a security product or any tool that they themselves can use. But just because you can use it and just because you can figure out the weird way that you programmed it doesn't mean that anybody else can necessarily use it, right? Uh, if you were to hand somebody a command line tool or like a copy of OpenSSL, right, and ask them to encrypt something with it, right, nobody would be able to figure that out unless they were a, system, a sysadmin or a professional cryptographer or a CS student maybe, and I would still have to look at the man page, right? It's, it's, so don't assume that just because you can use your tool or just because it seems usable to you means that anybody else that's gonna try to use it can use it. Um, and yeah, sure, you can build something that you can use real well, but I'm assuming that you're not building software just for yourself. And if you are, hey, great. And this talk is not for you. If you're building software only for yourself, then do your thing and you know, uh, hopefully nobody else can break it, right? I hope you get it audited. But the fact is, we don't write software for ourselves. We write software for other people to use, right? And other people will misuse our software. They don't know how to use it. They will abuse it, right? Other people don't share your internal thought processes. Other people don't share your world view, right? Um, and so you need to be thinking about and, and studying what a user is going to do, right, when they're working with your software. Um, and users will do some interesting things, right? Users will usually make the wrong choice. If you give somebody a choice, they're basically guaranteed to make the wrong one. Or you should assume that they will make the wrong one, right? So don't give them wrong choices, right? 
ideally give them as few choices as possible because really people don't like making decisions, right? If I were to ask you where you want to go to lunch today, you'd probably go, oh, I don't know, where do you want to go, right? Nobody likes to make decisions, right? Uh, occasionally people do, and you can hide that in a menu somewhere, right? Because that's for the person that's going, the, that's for the power user, right? That's for the computer scientist, right? That's going to specifically go hunting for that. But for the most part, users are bad at dealing with choice. And they're also bad at dealing with complexity, right? Uh, users don't want to think about key sizes, right? Uh, people don't want to think about fingerprints. People don't want to know about cryptography, right? Uh, people don't want to know about security, right? They, they want security to just sort of happen and never get in their way, right? And you could argue that that's a little unfortunate. Maybe people should be internalizing these things. And yeah, I think they should. But for now, people are not internalizing security. People are not internalizing these concepts. So you have to meet them where they are, right? And you have to work with them. And users aren't cryptographers. So stop thinking that they are. If people are seeing AES in your program, that's a problem, right? You should never be showing cryptography primitives to your users. You should never be showing security <coughs> primitives to your users, right? You should be assuming that your users don't know as much as you do about computers and programming and cryptography. And you shouldn't have to be a cryptographer to use cryptography tools, right? I shouldn't have to understand the public-private key model to use PGP, right? Uh, I shouldn't have to understand how the CA system works to use HTTPS, right? Nobody should have to be a cryptographer to get the benefits of cryptography. You should only have to be a cryptographer to come up with new cryptography, right? And so this is where we're at. And sorry, that was a rant. Um, the, but the situation is pretty grim, right? PGP, for example. Uh, is, are you all familiar with PGP? No? Like one person? Oh, wow, OK. Uh, I fear that I, so if I use a term that you guys don't understand, feel free to interrupt me, please, and be like, what the hell do you mean by that? Um, uh, so because I, I fear that I may have overshot the mark a little bit. Um, so PGP, pretty good privacy. Uh, it is the system that is used for encrypting email, right? <coughs> PGP is one of the oldest and most robust uh, systems of encryption that we have. It's one of the oldest end-to-end -end encrypted communication software that we have, which means that I can send you an encrypted message and theoretically nobody else can read it, right? PGP has been around for decades, decades, and it's still damn near unusable, right? A lot of smart programmers still can't use PGP, right? Because it's so complex and so difficult and just, and it's not even that complex. It's just that the UIs that we've designed for it are just horrendous, right? So there was a paper uh, written in 1999 called Johnny Can't Encrypt by Witten and uh, some other folks. Uh, and you should go, it's online, you should check it out. It's a great paper. Uh, they did a study on the, they did a user study on the usability of PGP5, right? They took 12 people and they put them in a room and they gave them 90 minutes and they asked them to send it, send it and sign, an, or encrypt and sign an email and send it to somebody um, and do some other operations related to PGP like signing keys, uh, downloading keys, verifying keys, backing up a key, revoking a key, right? Some basic operations like that. But the most basic operations, of course, are encrypting an email, which, do you guys understand what encryption is? Okay, good. Um, and signing an email, which proves that I'm the one that sent it, for example, right? Of those most basic operations, only four out of 12 users were able to sign an encrypted email. And they were given 90 minutes to do this task. In 90 minutes, only 25% of people were able to sign and send an encrypted email. And this was with a GUI, with buttons, that said sign and encrypt, right? But the GUI was still so bad and still so counterintuitive to anybody not familiar with concepts of cryptography that they were 
unable to complete the task. Yeah? Were these computer science people or just random people? No, so these were not computer science people. Um, maybe one of them was. Uh, but I think for the most part, they were just uh, random people around the campus that they had picked. Um, but random people around the campus. So, you know, like ostensibly, you know, reasonably smart people, right? Um, ostensibly. So, seven years later, there was another paper uh, that came out in 2006, Johnny Still Can't Encrypt, right? Uh, in this paper, uh, they studied PGP 9, right? Um, and uh, I think they studied it on Outlook this time. Um, and any guesses as to how many people were able to, they, they had six participants this time, which is a smaller N factor. Um, but I think this was a preliminary draft of the paper. It's still pretty telling though. Any guesses as to how many people were able to do it this time? One or two? One or two? One. Zero. <laughs> Not a single person was able to sign and encrypt a message, right? This is, I mean, what? What are we doing? How have we gotten this bad? This is so bad, right? Nobody can use the oldest, most robust crypto tool that we have, right? This is a terrible situation, right? Um, and so, you know, has it gotten better? Maybe it's gotten better, right? Okay, we've had two white papers about how bad PGP is now, right? Maybe we can improve it, right? Maybe some designers have taken up the challenge and come up with some better designs, right? So there's a product, uh, there's a browser, or sorry, um, there's a mail client called Thunderbird, which is an open source email client from the same people that make Mozilla, uh, or Firefox. And there's an extension for that called Enigmail, which uh, the idea of Enigmail is to make PGP easy to use, right? Or, well, um, so has the situation gotten better? Well, so a part of PGP is verifying that somebody, that a message that was sent to you is actually from the person that uh, sent it, right? And we do this cryptographically with PGP signatures, right? So in Enigma here, we have this helpful dialogue which says unverified signature. Okay, we're not sure that this is actually the person who it's purporting to be, right? Click on details button for more information. When we click on the details button, we get this helpful information. Import public key or some security info or copy Enigma security info. That's not helpful to anyone, right? That's okay, so I am Alice, right? And I have just received this email with this unverified signature. Oh, that sounds bad, right? What do I do? I click details. Import public key, what the hell do I do with that, right? This is not useful. So I would argue that the usability of PGP has not improved at all in the decades and two white papers of study on this problem, right? Um, and I have uh, some more examples in a little bit. but. Obviously, this is a huge problem, right? And we need to build better tools, right? And we have pretty good tools. We have really great cryptography, right? Elliptic curves, if you're into cryptography, check that out. It's amazing, right? But we need to build better tools for average users, right? We need to build better tools for people that aren't CS students, for people that aren't thinking about elliptic curves, right? For people that aren't thinking about security. Right? And all the fancy crypto, right? PGP is still great math after decades, right? The math there is, is amazing. It's mind blowing, right? The, the cryptography there is fantastic. But it doesn't matter if people can't use it, right? I can tell everyone I know to use PGP, and maybe five of them will succeed in doing it once and then never use it again, because what, they're just gonna email each other? Great, we have five people sending encrypted messages. Well, let's round them all up, and I guess everyone else is fine, right? So, all the fancy math in the world doesn't matter if people can't use your crypto thing. So, end of rant number two. <laughs> um, thanks for sticking around, by the way. You totally could have eaten lunch, or gotten a drink, or like done any one of any number of productive things, but instead you came here, so that's fantastic. Um, so some case studies. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a little break from all my anger ranting, 
and start with some good examples. Right. These are things that I think uh, have really hit the mark in one way or another on making security and crypto software that uh, is actually usable by people. Right. And so my favorite one right now is this Android app called Text Secure. So this is an Android app that lets you send encrypted SMS messages to anyone else using Text Secure. Um, it also stores your messages encrypted on your phone so that if anyone were to get a hold of your phone, they wouldn't be able to read the text messages, right? Um, and it's really cool. It looks exactly like a text messaging app should, right? And it works exactly like a text messaging app. You can still text people that aren't using Text Secure, right? It gets out of your way and it transparently adds as much security as it possibly can without inconveniencing, well, well, inconveniencing the user as little as possible, right? You still have to enter a password when you start tech secure. Okay, that's the trade-off, right? Something has to happen, something has to give. But entering a password one time when you start your text messaging software isn't that bad. I've set it up for a lot of non-computer savvy people and they've been happy with it, right? And they've used it and they've been sending me encrypted messages and it's been great, right? Um, and it works really well. You just start sending messages, and uh, if the other person is using Tech Secure, it starts automatically encrypting them. Um, and it's, it's pretty damn seamless, right? So I'm happy with this because it doesn't show the user the cryptography at all, right? It doesn't get in the way with the cryptography and say, hey, we're doing cryptography here. What do you want to use? Do you want to use AES? Do you want to use Rindow? What do you want? What do you want? What do you like, right? It doesn't assume that anybody is a cryptographer, right? It assumes that, and because the point of security software is not security, right? Security is a second goal. It's a secondary goal, right? The point is to get something done, right? I want to send an email. I want to send a text message, right? That's the primary goal. The secondary goal is security, right? Nobody, nobody is writing security software for the sake of security, right? Or very, very little, right? And this accomplishes the primary goal very well, right? This is a very good text messaging app, right? With a, and it does a really good job of accomplishing its secondary goal and getting out of the way. Uh, another great example is CryptoCat. CryptoCat is a uh, website browser add-on uh, thing that uses JavaScript cryptography. Um, and if anyone has opinions about that, I'd be happy to debate. Um, it's a... Uh, is great for group uh, chatting, right? And it automatically encrypts everything to the entire group that you're chatting with. All you have to do to use CryptoCat is go to a website. Anybody can go to a website. Going to a website is like the easiest thing that we've come up with to do on a computer, right? All I have to do is go to a website and tell my other friends to go to this website, and then I can have an encrypted chat with all 50 of you right now, right? That's fantastic, right? It's super easy. Again, it doesn't uh, make you look at encryption keys. It doesn't make you verify things. It doesn't make you come up with a PGP key and then store it forever. It doesn't make you learn about public-private key encryption, right? You don't have to know about any of those things to use CryptoCat. All you have to do is be able to open a fairly modern browser and type in a URL or click on a link, right? This is something anybody can do, and this is fantastic, right? Um, another great example, you'll notice these are all end-to-end -end, like communications things, uh, and I don't know, I guess that's because I think communications are really important. They're also sort of the most interesting, they're some of the most interesting things that we encrypt, and they're some of the most common things that we want to encrypt. So, um, sorry if there's a little bias in that, uh, but it's the thing that's most interesting to me, so there you go. Uh, off the record messaging, right? Uh, and this is separate from Google's off the record, which means just means that they don't log you. Off the record messaging is a protocol that again uses public private key encryption to uh, send encrypted messages back and forth uh, from me to you. And again, so this is an application called Chat Secure for Android. Um, this is one of many implementations of OTR. Uh, and Chat Secure is also 
pretty seamless, right? You uh, use it over Jabber or AIM or whatever, you know, Gchat, Facebook chat, whatever protocol you like, right? And you just start sending messages, and if the other person uh, also has some sort of OTR client, right, like Chat Secure or Pigeon or ADM does it on Max, right? Uh, the conversation just starts automatically becoming encrypted, and that's what that green bar up there is signifying, right? And again, this accomplishes the primary goal really well. I just want to chat with somebody, right? I don't want to, I don't want to sit around exchanging keys first. I don't want to have to meet face to face first to come up with a secret, right? That's all dumb. I just want to chat with you, right? Uh, and this does that really well. Again, it just opportunistically encrypts. It does what we call opportunistic encryption, right? Where if it has the opportunity, it starts encrypting things. And if it doesn't have the opportunity, if the other person is not using OTR, it does not encrypt, right? Um, and so it gives you the most security possible every time, right? It, 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 its state is to uh, trend toward more security, right? Without getting in the user's way. Um, and my final good example is Tor browser. So uh, Tor, are you off? Do you know, does anybody not know what Tor is? You can say if you don't know, because that gives me a better indication. Okay, it's <laughs> great. So Tor is um, an anonymity uh, network and software to give you some measure of uh, location anonymity online, right? The idea is that uh, if you're using Tor, nobody should be able to tell both where you're coming from on the network and what you're trying to view on the internet, right? Um, you can maybe tell one or the other if you're at a certain point, but you should never be able to tell both. Um, and so that's what Tor does. And Tor is really useful. This is some of the coolest uh, cryptography software we have, right? It's really good for uh, getting out of censored countries. Uh, it's really good for getting out of networks that are filtered, sorry. Um, it's really good if you're a journalist and you need to communicate with a source confidentially, right? And you need a way to do that. Uh, Tor is a great way to do that, right? It's really good for dissidents um, in countries such as, you know, China, Saudi Arabia, the US. Um, it's really good for all these things, right? And Tor Browser, Tor Browser Bundle is the thing that they've released. And this makes Tor so simple. All you have to go, all you have to do is go to torproject.org, download Tor Browser Bundle, and you open it up, and it immediately sets up all of the most secure possible defaults for Tor. And then it gives you this page saying, congratulations, your browser is configured to use Tor. This is a live page, by the way, and if it fails in some way, it gives you a scary warning page, or scary error page instead, right, that makes you not want to use it. This is like, I mean, click one download, open one program, and suddenly I have access to some of the most advanced cryptography and some of the most advanced anonymity software there is with all the most security faults. That's fantastic, right? And so before this, you had to download Tor, and then you basically had to be a cryptographer to know what all the weaknesses of Tor were, right? And you had to know why Tor might leak your requests over DNS, and you had to know what DNS was, right? Um, and uh, otherwise, you might not be using Tor correctly, right? And you might pierce your veil of anonymity. And then this came out, and now all you have to do is download Tor Browser Bundle, and suddenly you're using Tor with all the best defaults, right? Um, don't let that make you think that Tor is going to provide you perfect anonymity all the time. Um, Specifically, there was one case in some other college where a kid on the campus tried to use Tor to email in a bomb threat, uh, but he did this from campus, and it turned out he was the only one using Tor on campus at the time. And so they went back through the logs and found the one person using Tor, and lo and behold. So don't do any shit like that. Um, not that any of you would. Now on to the bad. I get to be angry again. This is a much more comfortable state for me, being angry. <laughs> so OTR verification, right? Um, so let me unpack this a little bit. You, when you're talking to somebody, right, when we're using encryption, right, encryption uh, is taking care of the uh, 
content of the message, right? It, in, it encrypts that and it keeps it a secret, right? Um, but it does not authenticate who I'm actually talking to, right? It doesn't prove to me that I'm actually talking to this guy, right? It only proves to me, this only encryption on its own only proves to me that nobody else in the middle has read what, pardon me, what we're saying, right? And so verification proves that I am actually talking to Bob, right? Um, and so OTR, off the record chat again, uh, has a method for verification uh, that's built in. And what they've come up with actually is so close to the mark, right? It seems really cool, right? So normally uh, in PGP, for example, to do verification, I have to read to you what's called a fingerprint, right? Which is a, uh, for some value of short, a short uh, hash of uh, my private key. Uh, and so that was probably a little above. Basically, it's a number that is provably linked to me, right? Um, and reading, you, and the way you do this in PGP is you call your friend and you read this really long number, right? And then they verify that they have the same number for you. And then uh, they read back a number and you verify that you have the same number for them, right? And then you know that you're talking to each other and nobody in the middle is decrypting and then re-encrypting your messages to uh, Bob, right? So, but that's kind of a pain in the ass, right? And you kind of, it, it's, it's, it's again the thing that I was saying where you have to sort of be a cryptographer to understand what the hell is going on there, right? Uh, or at the very least, you have to understand cryptography primitives to understand why you should do that, right? So OTR came up with this other system, which seems really great, right? How would you like to authenticate your buddy? Question and answer, right? Oh, that seems, that seems great, right? So a question, uh, where did we meet, right? A question that only your buddy would know. Right? And then you type in the answer, right? In this case, I typed in my office, 815 Eddy Street, right? And so then my buddy gets this dialog box that says, where did we meet, right? And so they might think, oh, well, we met at Cooper's office, 815 Eddy Street, right? But they typed it with a period. These two answers are not the same answer. And so because the way this works, I don't see the answer. The answer gets turned into a big long number, and then those numbers get matched up, right? So when I try to do this, it fails every time, right? And in the end, I have to call my buddy and say, hey, the answer is 815 at E Street without a period, right? And then they can finally type it in, right? This is so close to being the right thing that it hurts me because I really want to be able to do this, right? This is something that anybody can understand but it just misses the mark, right? Um, and cryptographically, I don't know what the solution to that is, but I think that there, I think that there's a better thing that we can come up with, and maybe one of you will come up with that better thing, right? Uh, this uh, case study is done on OCR with Pigeon, which is a IAM client for Linux and um, Windows, I guess. Uh, so another bad example, TrueCrypt. Uh, TrueCrypt is, are any of y'all familiar with TrueCrypt? No? Yeah? You? Cool. Uh, TrueCrypt is a piece of software that lets you uh, encrypt files or maybe even your whole drive on Windows, right? Uh, and it's now defunct. I don't know what's going on with it. I wouldn't use it. But there was a great example, right, of users are not cryptographers, right? Somebody just wants to encrypt a file, right? The goal is I need to keep this file secret. It has tax information in it, right? It has, uh, you know, my naked pictures, whatever, right? I need to keep this secret. I need to save it, right? So, okay, well, what do we have on Windows? Well, let's use TrueCrypt, right? I open up TrueCrypt immediately. Encryption algorithm. What the hell is an encryption algorithm? I just want to make my photos secret. I don't know what AES or Serpent or Two Fish are. I guess I'll pick Serpent Two Fish because that sounds cool at least, right? <laughs> Like, why, why would your users ever need to see this menu, right? Why would they, just pick the strongest algorithm because you're ostensibly a cryptographer. <coughs> just pick the strongest algorithm and go with that, right? Don't give the users a chance to shoot. If you give people a foot gun, they will use it. <laughs> so 
none of this. None of this should have ever happened, right? The proper user interface for this is what file would you like to encrypt? What is the password? That password's not strong enough, and I'll get to that later. But that password's not strong enough. Use a stronger password. Okay, there's your encrypted file, right? That's the proper UI. The, this is not the proper UI. The proper UI is never to try to educate your users about AES standards and two fish and serpent and blowfish. And I mean, at least they're not using weak cryptography in here, right? At least there's not like DES in here or triple DES or something like that in here, right? So it could be worse, but it, that's still pretty bad. But then there's the really bad, the worst of the worst my least favorite cryptography of all. And it's the one you've all heard of. HTTPS. Boy, we have seriously screwed this up. So we have, an, uh, and, and I, I missed my uh, favorite graphic on this, right? Which was a graphic um, from IE saying, uh, it said cryptography and like it said the name of the standard right in the error message. And it was like, this is an insecure standard. Are you sure you want to continue? What the hell is the user going to do there? I don't know what an insecure standard is. Just let me see my web page, you stupid pop-up, right? Uh, this is bad. And I think this is bad for a couple of reasons, right? One reason, uh, and, and these are sort of two diametrically opposed reasons, right? Uh, and I'll leave it as an exercise to you to figure out how I reconcile these in my mind. Um, one reason it's bad is that we've trained people to just click the OK, go through button, right? We've trained people to just go through no matter what, right? And I mean, this is actually a lot better than the situation was, right? The situation was that you would just say, I don't know, cryptography error, what do you want, right? And the user would click, well, I don't give a shit about that, just let me see the site, right? But still, I don't think this should happen, right? I mean, one, we as system administrators have to not let our certificates expire and have to not use certificates that don't actually work, right? And pages like this actually do help sysadmins to, and uh, people that are running sites to not do this sort of thing, right? Um, but the other problem I have with this, right? And so yeah, in some cases, right, you want the user to just not be able to view a site with a bad certificate, right? If the user is going to a bank, right, and the bank has a bad certificate, that's probably a very bad sign, right? And you probably actually want to show a screen like this, right? And you don't even want to give them the option to go back, right? Because that's, you know, unless they like click through three men, or go through, sorry, not back. You don't even want to give them the option to go through and ignore the certificate warning, right? Unless they click through like three menus because they absolutely know what they're doing, right? Or, you know, maybe they don't and they're just that industrious and will find a way to uh, shoot themselves with that proverbial foot gun again. But I think there's another problem with this. Um, and this one, this is the more, maybe more controversial problem with this, which is that in a lot of cases, I would argue that having a uh, invalid certificate is actually better than having no certificate at all, right? I would argue that visiting a site over plain text should be given a much scarier warning than, giving, than visiting a site with a bad certificate, right? Because, yeah, bad certificates happen. We're, it, the CA process is a horrendous mess, and it actually is sometimes hard to get a valid certificate, right? It also costs money, right? I would argue that some security, which is presented by a certificate, is oftentimes, again, maybe banks are an exception, uh, oftentimes better than no security at all, right? I'm gonna give you the some amount of security, right? And I'll give you a warning, but that's still better than visiting a plain text site, right? Because visiting plain text sites can do really scary things, right? Like people can read everything that you're doing on that site and people can inject malware into your network stream. Your ISP <coughs> can do that, right? Really great paper on this, really great article uh, in, um, <coughs> crap, I can't remember the name of the newspaper now. Um, search for YouTube cat videos malware uh, on DuckDuckGo or Google, and you'll find the article I'm talking about. It's fantastic. It's brand new, done by some great researchers. The Intercept, that's the name of the newspaper. 
Uh, and you should find this article on there, because it's really good. Uh, it's about how malware can infect you over YouTube cat videos uh, at the behest of your ISP. So yeah, HTTPS, we really screwed this one up. We need to come up with better UIs for this. But when it works, it's great. Uh, this, and there's, there's sort of a counter example to this. When, it, when HTTPS works, it's fantastic, because things are getting encrypted, and the user doesn't even need to ever know about it, right? And only the sysadmins and trained computer scientists have to deal with this stuff. And that's exactly where we want to be, right? We want users to be encrypted all the time without even knowing it, right? Um, and then I'm going to pick on Enigma again. I'm going to pick on PGP again, because you know what? They deserve it. PGP has been around for decades, and it's still so bad, right? So here's a PGP message, right? I'm trying to write to my friend Alice here. How the hell do I encrypt, right? Where on this page do I encrypt an email? Down there, right there. If I click that little key right there, I can encrypt this message. Well, well, there's this big button up here, right? It says Enigma Mail. Maybe that's, right? I, okay, man, maybe that has something to do with PGP, right? This is what it brings up. Use defaults and rules for encryption. Well, that seems checked. That's good, right? There's defaults and rules. Right? I, I like defaults and rules. I, this makes me feel good about things, right? Um, or I can force encryption. I don't want to force anything. That's kind of scary, right? Like, I don't, what if the other person doesn't want to encrypt? I don't want to force them to do it, right? I don't, force signing? What is signing even? Why am I, I'm, is, does this make this a legal document? I don't know, you know? PGP mime? What, what, it, what does a guy that doesn't talk have to do with encryption? I don't even understand, right? This is the user's thought process when they click this box, right? This is a useless box. This does not help anyone encrypt in any way. It took me about two minutes of looking at this box to figure out how somebody could use this box to encrypt something, right? That's really bad. No, stop this, right? We need to just be doing this stuff transparently, right? Without making the user think about it. Cool, so I'm uh, getting a little light on time here. I have uh, three more slides, and I'm going to try to blow through them quick so I can leave some time for questions for y'all. Another problem I have is password restrictions, right? There are some really abysmal password restrictions. This one is especially great. The password must be exactly eight characters long. It must contain one letter, one number, and one special character. The only special characters allowed are at, pound, or dollar sign. Special character must not be located in the first or last position. Two of the same characters sitting next to each other are considered a set. No sets are allowed. Avoid using names such as your name, user ID. This one. Other words that cannot be used are Texas, child, and the months of the year. That's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're just those, though. You can use, like, California or Tennessee, but not Texas. <laughs> um, I mean, this is really, like, what, what are we doing, right? What is this? First of all, you're making the user go through this crap, right, to figure out a password. And second of all, is this increasing security? No. Not in any way, right? Here's an allowed password in this scheme. One, two, three dollar sign ABC, right? This is an acceptable password. One of the few sets of acceptable passwords, right? It takes about 11.6 bits of entropy. Uh, that's about the size of this space, right? The <coughs> takes minutes to crack, right? On a reasonable system with a reasonable budget, we buy a number of CPUs or GPUs or whatever, right? What's a not allowed password? Something like correct horse battery staple, right? This password has about 62.8 bits of entropy, right? A longer password is always better, right? I'm going to, eh, exceptions, caveats. But in general, a longer password is always better, right? This password would take, so don't use this specific password, because this was used as an example in XKCD. And also, a lot of people have used it as examples. So this particular one probably has like zero bits of entropy. But something like this would have about 62.8 bits of entropy and would take centuries to crack. Right? So how is forcing somebody to put a dollar sign in there, right? Or forcing somebody to not put a dollar sign in there, right? Upper limits on password length is abysmally stupid. Don't ever do that. If you find a site that does that, don't use it. Call up the programmers and yell at them. Um, <laughs> I'm encouraging good behavior. Um, OK, so I have a couple of minutes left. Um, and we're, we're nearing the end here. So do's. Some do's and don'ts for you all. Make crypto operations transparent, right? Cryptography should happen transparently. It should happen opportunistically. It should happen automatically, right? Security should happen automatically, transparently, and opportunistically, right? Do the smartest thing and that you can by default. And 
Don't give the users the opportunity to shoot themselves in the foot, right? Don't make them work for security, right? Because they don't want to work for security. Have sensible defaults. Do years of testing, right? Give the program to 10 people that aren't computer science students and see how many of them can use it the way that you expect them to, right? <coughs> Pardon me. And in your failure cases, Fail in the way that's least harmful to the user, right? Uh, determining what least harm is is left as an exercise for you guys. I'm not going to tell you what is the least harmful thing to do to your users. You can figure that out on your own. Some don'ts. Don't have stupid password restrictions. I already said that, but those are really dumb. Come on. Uh, don't ever show the users the letters AES. Don't ever show the users the word hash, right? Don't, don't pretend that the users are cryptographers. Don't pretend that they even want to know about cryptography, right? Don't have insecure defaults. Don't use an insecure crypto system. Don't, don't fail open, right? Don't have your security fail to where uh, all the user's secrets are now leaked and open, right? Don't use abstractions that don't make sense to the users, right? People don't want to know or understand about public and private keys. People don't want to know or understand about fingerprints, right? So don't use those. Don't assume that users are cryptographers or know anything about cryptography. And don't assume that less security is better than no security, right? Don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough, right? Um, some security is almost always better than nothing at all. So uh, that's about it. EFF is running a crypto usability prize called the EFF Cup. Uh, this prize we're going to give out to the most usable, best, and, and encrypted communication software. Uh, if you're writing something like that, you should check out the EFF website. More info will pop up there eventually. Uh, and that's it. Then, thanks. So uh, I think we're like right on the time limit. A couple of questions. Yeah. What was the horrible password thing from? That was, I think, was from like a some state website. Um, I think it was like a Texas, I don't know, social services or something like that. You can you can rely on governments to come up with the stupidest password schemes though. What are bits of entropy? What's that? Bits of entropy. Oh yeah, so bits of entropy. Um, that's a great question. So bits of entropy is basically um, the amount of bits uh, that you would that a password like this takes up, right? So you would have to search every possible value. You would have to do an exhaustive search of every possible value that could be held in 62.8 bits on average to come up with the correct value. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you uh, have information. If somebody wanted to set up a Tor relay, yeah. what the minimum hardware requirements would be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, so the minimum re hardware requirements, I think, are pretty low. Um, like. Something that's you know big enough to act as you know a router is fine. Really, the main requirement though is bandwidth. Yeah. Um, we want high bandwidth things for yeah. Tor relays, right? Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of information about that. There, we did the Tor relay challenge at EFF where we challenged people to sign up Tor relays, um, and so there's a lot of information in the FAQ there uh -huh. about setting up a Tor relay. And if you're interested, uh, check that out. That's it. Do you know if anybody's been has set one up on like a Raspberry Pi or something like that? I don't know. A Raspberry Pi might be a little too small. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I would load test it. If you were going to do that, I would try to like get 10 people on it, putting network traffic through it, traffic through it, and load test it like that, and make sure that it's. See what happens. Yeah. See what happens. <laughs> well, thanks again. Yeah.